Hi, I'm Susan Carroll. I am the postdoc director at the lab, and I am happy to welcome our 14 finalists for the Research Slam and all of our virtual audience and our virtual judges to this year's Slam. The Slam is a yearly event that is open to all of our postdocs, and it's a format in which they present their research in a compelling fashion with three slides in less than three minutes. They're evaluated not only on their um, intellectual significance of their work and their contributions, but the presentation itself is very much a speaking contest. Our judges today are our directorate um, leader, Kim Budell, our deputy director of um, uh, science and technology, Pat Falcone, our chief of staff, Cheryl Hingorani, um, Greg Susky, uh, who is no, um, no stranger to Building 111 um, and is currently at the Livermore Lab Foundation, and the vice president of research and innovation at the University of California, Teresa Maldonado. These judges have a really hard task from our 14 finalists. They will be um, selecting the top um, three who will receive cash awards. These top three will also compete in the Bay Area Research Slam, um, which will be later in the month. We also have a, career, or a People's Choice Award for um, our our virtual audience to elect. So pay attention to and vote for your, fa your favorite speakers. Um, we, will, um, we will also have um, a giveaway um, for our, our virtual audience as well. So events like this, they don't happen by themselves. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge all of the hard work that our postdocs have put in, both in the preliminary rounds and these final rounds for, on their presentations. I'd like to thank our judges. Um, I would like to thank our um, presentation coach who held workshops for all of our postdocs and then also gave one-on-one -on -one coaching um, to the finalists. Um, the Research um, Slam Committee, they have done an enormous amount of heavy lifting to get this event off the, off the ground. And there's also um, a, a lot of additional contributors from those who um, made the trivia slides that you'll see later, as well as the um, images from our lab photographers um, and our, the video crew that's here making all of this possible. So with... Um, with that, I would like to introduce our, e our MC for, the pre or for today's show, um, Annie Kirsting. Annie Kirsting leads the University Relations and Science Education Office here. This is a very important um, office here at the laboratory that helps to ensure we have the scientists, um, engineers, um, to meet our mission in future years. So Annie? Thanks, Susan, for that great introduction and explaining how the show is going to go today. We are super excited to be at this point today. It's a lot of work, as Susan said, getting to this point, and we're going to hear from 14 uh, speakers today. And I do want to just plug um, again, pre please stay throughout the whole um, time because you are going to be able to vote um, on your favorite um, speaker at the very end. So. Let's get the show on the road. Our first speaker is Mark Burton from PLS. And the, and the title of his talk is, oops, I can't read that far away. So, um, hot nuclear materials plus controlled atmospheres equals what? Nuclear energy is a wonderful thing. It's a constant source of power, is a low carbon footprint, and currently accounts for 10% of the world's electricity. 
Not to be corny, but with that power comes great responsibility. The existence of nuclear energy means there's a constant potential for nuclear terrorism. And because that threat affects every person and ecosystem on the planet, we need to know how nuclear materials are affected by different environments. If someone were to use nuclear materials to cause harm, there would be several questions asked, ranging from what materials left behind to what are the long-term impacts. The answer to those questions have been sought after for decades, with over 2,000 nuclear tests worldwide to determine the effect of explosions in different environments. We've learned a lot from those tests and have since developed computer models to help answer some of those questions, like predicting the fate and transport of nuclear particles throughout the atmosphere. But it's not enough. We need more experimental data to improve our predictive capabilities. And we need to collect this data in a safely controlled laboratory setting. So I've developed a method to carefully study high temperature reactions between metals, such as uranium, and controlled environments. Now, unlike that photo, I was clearly wearing gloves while doing this, but basically what I did was put a piece of metal inside of a secure vacuum chamber and then filled that chamber with anything we wanted to study, 100% oxygen, 1% nitrogen, anything we wanted to know. I then hit that metal with a focused laser beam to get some of that metal into the gas phase. This hot gas phase metal reacted with the environment to produce solid particulates that I could then analyze to determine how hot metals react in different environments. And what I've learned is that the material formed by this process is highly dependent on the type of local conditions, uh, the concentrations of different gases, how quickly the metals heated, and how pristine the original metal surface is. All of this new information can now be used as additional input into our computer models to improve our predictive capabilities of nuclear events. With this safe uh, laboratory system of studying high temperature reactions, we can now start to incorporate other environmental factors like carbon to mimic organic material, or silicon to mimic sand, or maybe multiple metals to mimic infrastructure. By doing these experiments now, we will have the answers to those oh-so-important questions in case a nuclear disaster occurs. Thank you. Our second speaker, Mary Berkey from WCI, and the title of her talk is Planetary Defense, the Nuclear Option. If you saw something like this 66 million years ago, you would probably guess that the dinosaurs are in for a really rough day. But this photo is actually from 2013, when a much smaller asteroid exploded over a town in Russia, injured almost 1,500 people, damaged thousands of buildings, and reminded us that asteroids are still a natural hazard. But that's where planetary defense comes in. If we locate the asteroid in time, we have the technology to prevent it from impacting entirely. And one of the options we have at our disposal, which we would only use in a dire emergency, is launching a nuclear device. Just the device, though. Bruce Willis doesn't need to go to. Now, in an emergency, we would likely be both flying blind in terms of what the asteroid looks like and very short on time. It's also against international law to test a nuclear device in space. So how do we know if a mission would even work? The answer is simulations, tons of simulations for every possible scenario imaginable. And since this will be in an emergency, we want to make sure that these simulations are done well in advance. The problem is, these are very difficult to run. The problem itself spans over 10 orders of magnitude in terms of length and time. There's no one simulation that can cover that scale, so you have to break the process into stages. When the device detonates, the photons it emits will interact with the atoms on the surface of the asteroid, and they'll deposit their energy. That requires a radiation transport code to model. And then the deposit of energy will develop into a shock wave, which you can model with a hydro code. 
And then the change in orbit over weeks and months can be modeled with an end body simulation. The last two stages are difficult, but at least there are lots of codes available for running them. The bottleneck is the radiation transport. These require a lot of computer resources and very detailed material models to work. The good news is Livermore actually specializes in these types of codes at the conditions that we need at high energy. So we've actually been working on this homework for quite some time. The bad news is these codes tend to not be available to everyone outside of the lab. And there's already tons of threats on this planet right now that require the lab's attention. So the bottom line is we have a really long way to go to do this homework, and we could really use some help. So for my work at the National Lab, I've been running hundreds of these radiation transport simulations to build up a simplified model that people can use to easily and accurately initialize the second stage hydro code without having to run the first stage. With the bottleneck removed, it'll be easier for both us and for other people to run these simulations with confidence. And that way, anyone from a NASA scientist to a college student can help us with this homework. So if an emergency does arise, we'll be prepared and we can hopefully save the Earth from a massive catastrophe. Thank you. OK, our next speaker is Sophia Rocco and from Engineering. And her title is Smile for the Neutron Camera. I turn my camera on. I cut my fingers on. In 1986, a submarine carrying 30 nuclear warheads sank, never to be recovered. If these weapons are ever recovered, it's going to be fairly important to have a way to non-invasively check them for damage. Less dramatically, but just as importantly, the US stockpile of nuclear weapons that have not been sleeping with the fishes also need to be checked non-destructively for safety and reliability, especially as they get older. So, what do we do when we need to see through metal, like the casing of a warhead? X-rays are gonna go right through plastic, but as you know, if you've ever gotten an X-ray and had to wear that heavy lead apron thing, they're gonna be stopped by metals, which cast a shadow in the X-ray image. Neutrons, on the other hand, those are gonna breathe right through metal, but are stopped or slowed down by plastics. So neutron radiography is the technique of shooting neutrons at an object and collecting the ones that make it through to the other side to form a shadow image of that object's internal components. And this is a key tool of stockpile stewardship. So you might be wondering, where are these neutrons going to come from? Nuclear reactors aren't exactly going to fit in your camera bag, and they're also not particularly cheap. So that is where our experiment, much smaller and relatively inexpensive, comes in. It's called a dense plasma focus, and it is a type of plasma-based accelerator that uses electricity to create an imploding column of plasma out of deuterium gas. So that's hydrogen with an extra neutron. This accelerates a beam of ions. That beam hits other ions, and they bind together in a fusion reaction, releasing one neutron. It's these neutrons that we use for our camera. So, more neutrons means a better image. And to do that, we need to know where the ions are. In order to figure this out, I'm building a laser interferometer that will help us determine this. Uh, the more electrons that the laser encounters as it travels through the plasma, the more its path is changed. So we measure that path change, and it tells us how many electrons are in the plasma, and therefore how many ions as well. So interferometry might tell us that we need more ions in a certain region of the plasma to induce more fusion reactions. And then we can tweak experimental knobs to make that happen. The, additionally, another thing that interferometry can do for us is help us verify and validate our computer simulations by comparing the experimental electron measurements with the ones that we get out of our simulations, which will help with our predictive capabilities of what our machine can do when we ever make changes. So finally, interferometry also allows us to measure the region where those neutrons come from and make it 
smaller, higher precision. So as you can imagine, detailed images are pretty important when the thing that you're imaging is potentially corroded warhead. Thank you very much. Okay, next, Hai Chao Miao is going to be speaking on his, giving his talk from the workshop to the holodeck, improving complex parts in virtual reality. We ride it, plug it, play it, burn it, rip it, drag it, drop it, zip and zip it, lock it, fill it, curl it, find it, view it, code it, jump and lock it, surf it, scroll it, pose it, pick it, cross it, crack it, twitch, update it, name it, read it, tune it, print it, scan it, send it, fax, rename it, touch it, ring it, pay it, watch it, turn it, leave it, start format it. Technologic. Technologic. Techn Additive manufacturing finds more and more applications in both research and industry. For example, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner has already more than a thousand additively manufactured parts. But we have seen in the fatal Challenger disaster what can happen if even a single part fails. Now, if you get on a plane, you want to be safe and trust that each part has been thoroughly inspected. But the question remains, how do we ensure safety when parts today are reaching unprecedented complexity? At the lab, finding new ways for inspection is essential for developing advanced production methods and new materials. Traditional inspection relies on two aspects. Manual inspection is fast and intuitive. The best thing is you can just take it in your hands and inspect it from all angles and perform measurements, but you can only measure the surface and not inside. For this reason, the second approach is to scan the part, usually slice by slice. And with computer support, we can now do quantitative assessments. But this is slow and unintuitive because now we have to consider all these high resolution slices. Unfortunately, developing automated inspection algorithms is not scalable since additive man manufacturing by nature produces unique parts, especially in an experimental setting here at the lab. But we can actually combine the best of two. Using a consumer-grade virtual reality headset, we can just take the scanned part into the virtual inspection room that we are developing and inspect the virtual part from all angles with computer support, so a semi-automated approach. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, I'm sorry, my research is already enabling experts to compare the scan of a built part with its initial design so that you can easily spot deviations from the, um, from the initial design. And in virtual reality, we're not limited by the laws of physics. Instead, we can equip ourselves with superpowers. With unlimited magnifications, we can see the most intricate details and perform exact measurements. And with no defect can hide from us if we use extra vision to look inside the part. And finally, we can perform dimensional testing and virtually fit parts together. After all, we want to be as effective as possible. And using my research in the virtual inspection room, we can find defects before they could potentially cause disasters. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Felicia Sutanto, Understanding Nothing. What if I tell you that the world we know is only less than 5% of the known universe? You, me, trees, planets, we're apparently only a tiny fraction of the universe. The rest of it, they're called dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter does not absorb, emit, or reflect lights, and therefore to our eyes they look invisible, yet we know they exist because of the effects they have on objects we can see directly. For many, many years, we have been searching for dark matter. Because we know that understanding dark matter is important to understand the size, shape, and future of our universe. And arguably, their existence may signify the rise of a new era of physics. No experiment so far has found evidence for their existence. Except one. This one experiment is called Dama Libra. And about 20 years ago, they made a huge controversy by uniquely claiming evidence for dark matter existence while others have found nothing. This mystery has baffled 
and thrilled physicists for more than two decades. I am now searching for an alternative explanation for the observed Dama Libra signal. Dama Libra searches for dark matter by looking for tiny flashes of light that are caused by dark matter slamming into atomic nuclei in their detector. The rises and falls of this signal should follow an annual pattern, and as the argument goes, this is because of Earth motion through stream of dark matter as we orbit the Sun. Now, Dama Libra observed this modulation. However, this modulation is left unconfirmed by other experiments, including those that employ the same detector material as Dama Libra, they have not seen this modulation. So the question we want to ask is, well, are there maybe other things that could also induce tiny light production that are somehow more pronounced in the Dama Libra setup? So in the lab, I explore potential probes that may produce such signal. I have these materials similar to the one used in the Dama Libra experiment, and I expose this material to UV, IR lights, I also plan to introduce variation in temperature and pressure, and to summarize the results so far, I seem to see one probe that may produce tiny light in this material. That said, more testing need to be done to test its reproducibility. If I manage to find these probes, it may shed some light on the world's most controversial dark matter signal. But if not, it is still a significant result, because I help to rule out possibilities that may seem viable, narrowing the window of search, and that may help us to understand nothingness observed by many dark matter experiments a little bit better. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Zachary Z Sims from PLS, and the title of his presentation is The Revolutionary Power of Disorder. The fundamental building block of all human innovation is the discovery and use of new materials. And I know that's a big statement, but I can prove it to you. Let's go back through history and think about all the different periods. They're typically defined based on the materials that enabled the technology. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Steel Age. But this means we're always going somewhere. Myself and others might suggest that the next revolution in material design could come from harnessing the power of disorder. And to understand what that means, let's think about how we've designed materials for a long time. For the most part, we take one element and we combine it with a little bit of other elements to change the properties just a bit. And you can think of this how you learn to dress, how your parents taught you. You take one color or one material and you combine it with a little bit of other colors or materials to change the visual interest just enough. What if you never learned how to dress? You may break all the rules. You may combine materials and patterns and shapes in ways that nobody had thought to before. And if you do this, you may create a pretty interesting outfit. And that's the essence of disorder-based design, breaking all the rules of material construction and design that we've had before. And so why do we do it? Why do we care? Well, if you take five elements and you combine 20% of each, and you do that, you end up with a balance of material properties that could never exist in the way we design materials in the past. The problem here is we're really rewriting the book on how you design materials. And by doing this, we have to start by rewriting the book. And as an experimentalist, that means that my day to day looks like testing and manufacturing a plethora of materials from across compositions that focus on how to harness disorder. And I take the results of these tests and I feed them back to modelers. And those modelers use those results to refine their predictive capability, to give me more materials to make and test. And then in this cycle, in this material design cycle, we are able to produce materials better and better than the previous. And if we keep doing this, if we keep working, we can continue to see improvements, such as the materials we've designed that show increased strength increased corrosion resistance in a combination that's never been seen before, or high strength and high ductility. So if we continue and we keep this cycle going for however long it takes, then maybe in 500 years, 
maybe in a thousand years, our ancestors will look back and they'll say, that was the start of something great. That was the start of an age of disorder. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Rebecca Walton from Engineering, and the title of her presentation is From uh, Blowpipes to Printing Nodes, the Continuing, the Continuing Glass Mission. Space, the final frontier. Now, we don't have starships just yet, but what we do have are satellite-based telescopes. Hypothetically, such telescopes could allow numerous researchers to peer into the unknown. However, in practice, access to such telescopes is fairly limited. This is due in part to the difficulty of manufacturing the mirror components necessary for light capture and focusing. These mirrors have to be perfectly polished, stiff, and lightweight enough to be launched into space. And as such, the process to create them is costly, time intensive, and highly specialized. These are all areas that I aim to address with my research. To do this, I am leveraging the versatility of 3D printing. Now, 3D printing is probably a far cry from what a lot of us envision when we think of, say, glass blowing, which uses a long metal blowpipe to form molten glass. My process is decidedly less dramatic, but it does offer some impressive advantages in terms of dimensional fidelity and geometric flexibility. I have developed a UV active glass resin formulation, which you can print and cure in a manner very similar to commercial plastic 3D printing. Because we can print and cure this resin at the same time, I've been able to use it to create structures which have previously been too complex or too thin to produce with other methods of glass additive manufacturing. Once printed, I can thermally process these structures into a transparent fused silica glass. Because fused silica can be polished to a very low surface roughness and has a low coefficient of thermal expansion and high stiffness, it makes it an ideal material for use in satellite technologies. To demonstrate the robustness of this printing process, I have created a variety of test structures, which notably includes some of the largest glass 3D printed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab to date. To begin, I have been printing many structures which are similar to those currently in use in satellite technology. However, one of the most exciting aspects of 3D printing is its capability to produce geometries which we're not able to make currently with other forming methods. To this end, we have plans to combine detailed stress simulations which approximate the polishing and use conditions each mirror will experience throughout its lifetime and intelligently design mirror supports based on those simulations and then print them. This flexibility, the inherent accessibility of 3D printing, and the reduction of costly machining steps means we can envision a bright future for 3D printed integrated optics. In a world where more researchers have access to satellite technology, we'll be able to boldly see what no one has seen before. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Morrison from PLS, and the title of his talk is Using Metagenomics to Evaluate Astronaut Health Risk. The countdown starts Watching in a trance The crew is certain Nothing left to chance All is working Trying to relax Up in the capsule Send me up a drink Jokes made your tongue The count goes on Four, three, two, one This year Three companies sent average everyday Americans outside of Earth's atmosphere on spacecraft those companies privately developed, showcasing the capabilities of bringing space travel and tourism to the masses. On the government side, NASA has also announced that in the next three years, they'll put the first woman and next man on the moon. But unlike the Apollo missions 50 years ago, the men and women on these missions will be on the moon's surface for weeks or months at a time. The technological advancements humanity has made is truly astonishing. 
but our oldest adversaries, disease and illness, still pose a major risk. And that's what my research hopes to minimize. My project, known as Microbial Tracking 2, collected skin, ear, nose, mouth, and saliva samples from four astronauts in the months leading up to their launch, during their time on the National Space Station, and in the months after they returned to Earth in order to see if and how spaceflight affects the human microbiome. And what our research has shown is that indeed, spaceflight does have an effect on our gut microbiome. If you look at the figure in front of you, you'll see the microbial composition of saliva samples from two astronauts over the course of this experiment. If you look at the colors, you'll see that certain groups of bacteria increase during spaceflight while others decrease. Now, we're all familiar with those probiotic commercials that talk about the importance of maintaining a healthy gut microbiome and the health benefits associated with this. Well, the oral microbiome is no different. Dysregulation of the oral microbiome, most commonly associated with poor oral hygiene here on Earth, can lead to plaque formation, dental cavities, gingivitis, and if left untreated, heart disease. Imagine for me, if you would, being on the International Space Station and developing a tooth infection, and the only treatment you had was painkillers until you could return to Earth. Well, for some astronauts, this is reality. In addition to the occasional oral infection, astronauts also exp report experiencing ear and sinus infections, as well as skin rashes and sensitivity in the days after they arrive in space. Astronauts that were quarantined and screened for disease prior to launch. Understanding how spaceflight affects the human microbiome and being able to minimize these changes is key to healthy long-term spaceflight. For decades, space scientists have said we're the middle child of history. Born too late to explore the world, but too early to explore the universe. Well, ladies and gentlemen, things are changing. There are people alive today that will set foot on extraterrestrial worlds for the first time in recorded history. And on those missions to Mars, Europa, and beyond, crew health will be mission critical. But for those in the audience who'd like to stay a little closer to home, I suggest a trip to the planned Voyager Space Hotel, where you can take a relaxing vacation with guaranteed out-of-this-world views. And thanks to my research, return as healthy as the day you left. Thank you. Our next speaker is Naomi Rios Arce, and the title of her presentation is, Does My Knee Hurt? How are you feeling, everybody? I hope you're feeling good, but I know, and I'm not your doctor, that some of you have feel knee pain. And the reason behind that is because one in four adults in the United States suffer from chronic knee pain. So sadly, it makes sense that for some of us, we are suffering this condition. And you might be wondering why? Why does my knee hurt so much? And the reason behind that, it can be because you might have this condition known as osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is well known to induce knee pain. And what happened in this condition is that the red tissue shown in this picture, known as your cartilage, that protects your bone and protects you for developing pain, gets degraded. When it gets degraded, your bone are gonna start rubbing in each other, and therefore, you're gonna develop a lot of knee pain. One interesting factor about osteoarthritis is that people with diabetes are very susceptible to develop this condition. Around 51% of diabetic patients have osteoarthritis. So if you're diabetic and your knee hurts a lot, it might be because you might have osteoarthritis. Another important factor about this condition is that we don't have any cure. So when you go to your doctor because your knee hurts so much, they will probably give you some pain medication to manage your pain because we don't have anything else for you. However, this is where my research is coming from. I'm really interested in trying to understand specifically how people with diabetes develop um, osteoarthritis and how can we create better treatments to help you manage your knee pain. How am I doing this? Since we can do these studies in human, I'm using a mouse model that has diabetes. What I'm showing you right here is a real sample for a knee of one of our animals. And if we focus in the diabetic animal, specifically in this square, you can see that there is not a lot of the red tissue that I told you early on protects you for developing knee pain. So these animals have osteoarthritis. But what is super excited about my research is not this. 
It is that I have found and I have identified this group of genes that nobody else has shown before play a role in, the, in osteoarthritis. And this is super excited for our lab and for everybody else because we are really hoping that using these genes and this information, we can target and create new therapies against osteoarthritis and we can help you feel better and have happier needs. I just want you to remember, next time that you're suffering from knee pain, our lab is working really hard, and when I say really hard, it's really, really hard, trying to identify better treatments against osteoarthritis so we can help you feel better. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Mariana Holly Batista, and the presentation title today is How Would You Survive the Next Heat Wave Without Electricity? Millions in California are dealing with the dangers of extreme heat and rapidly spreading wildfires. 103 degrees in downtown Los Angeles, 112 in Burbank, as climate change continues to yield record temperatures. Get out of the road! Relax, dude. Imagine the next heat wave. It's 110 degrees Fahrenheit outside. How will you keep cool? I bet your solution requires electricity, but 13% of the global population does not have access to electricity. Did you know that average over time, heat waves are the most deadly type of natural disaster in the US? Globally, heat waves killed more than 166,000 people in 20 years. Even here in California, we had blackouts during the summer last year, remember? It is urgent to find a way to cool without the need for electricity. It is not only comfort at stake, it is lives. Now, I want you to get a seasoning that everyone has in their kitchen. It is inexpensive and you use it to add taste to your food. Yeah, you are right if you guessed salt. In my research, I'm developing a 24 hours electricity free cooling alternative using salt. But first, let me show you how the Earth cools naturally. The Earth loses heat by infrared radiation that escapes into space at night. But during the day, the solar energy quickly outspaces the cooling of the Earth. The exciting news is we figured out how to make this cooling process work the entire day, even under direct sunlight. We discovered that by transforming salt cubes into this fluffy powder called aerogel, we have the perfect recipe for a material that emits infrared radiation, reflects the sunlight, and insulates the cold surface from heating back up. I'm packing these aerogels into panels that can cool surface well below ambient temperature. And it really works. The green curve represents my initial results which already matches the state-of-the-art cooling technologies. Now, look at the blue rectangle. With salt, I expect I can get up to 36 degrees Fahrenheit below ambient temperature. This is absolutely game-changing. We will finally have a way to offer free cooling to the population. My research can help reduce the $29 billion that Americans spend a year on electricity for air conditioning and also we reduce the 170 million metric tons of CO2 released into the air. Now, imagine being comfortable all summer without being dependent on energy at all. My research can help save lives anywhere people are dying due to the heat. Now, if I ask you, how do you survive the next heat wave without electricity? You will answer with salt. Our next speaker is Jorge Luis Barrera Cruz from Engineering, and his title is Optimizing Reactor Design for a More Sustainable Future. We can live in a world that we design. Every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me We can live in a world that we design, a world in which we combine our intellects and computational powers to effectively track and battle impending threats. 
like climate change. And I'm proud to be part of this battle by providing effective computational optimization tools that enable uh, the systematic design of certain applications. In particular, I am, per I am interested in the type of problems that you see on your left. Here you have uh, impending needs where that comes from um, energy sources, that comes from this energy uh, related issues uh, due to climate change. In this case, we have flaring due to um, flaring due to oil gases, in which you combine mostly. Um, well, there's something that definitely we cannot do any, 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 anymore. So, in this case, the problem that we have here is that unfortunately we have this large um, energy waste in our in our uh, in our systems. And what I want to do in this case is to create this type of uh, optimization approaches in which I go from uh, I can transform this gas into associated high liquid uh, fuels. And I do this by optimizing reactors, right? So my optimization problem consists of tube containing catalysts, like the ones that you see on the left. And here what you have is uh, the catalyst in purple, where there's highly exothermic chemical reactions occur. Now, what I want to do here is to maximize the heat generated by the system while keeping the maximum temperature under a threshold. Now, the way I do this is that I include this energy, uh, this fins, in the design domain. And what I want to optimize here is precisely the shape and arrangement of these fins to optimize for performance. Now, shape control in this type of optimized design tools can be tricky. And in this case, what I want to do is to include some manufacturing restrictions. And the only way I can do this is by using our supercomputers. Now, the optimization process here consists of um, computing quantities of interest at every optimization step over and over again to inform my design problem how to change the shapes until convergence, as you see in the animation. Now, there are a lot of things going on here, but overall, I just want you to appreciate how non-intuitive these designs look like and just to appreciate that by using these automatic design tools, we can get one step closer to designing a more sustainable future. Thank you. Our next speaker is Xu Li, Liu Li from PLS, and the title of her presentation is Tracking Lots of Dots to Help Searching for the Cure for Cancer. Cancer can be dreadful. In the year of 2019, there are more than 1,600 people have died of cancer every day in the United States. Enormous of efforts have been invested into the search of cancer drugs. And now we understand that one of the most promising targets for cancer drug is a protein called KRAS. In normal cells, the KRAS proteins would interact with each other, form clusters, and then generate a cascade of signals that manages the normal growth of the cells. However, in a large portion of the cancer cases, the KRAS proteins contain mutations. Their interactions are different. The cascade of signals are changed. And that will eventually lead to the development of cancer. So we want to understand the interactions of the KRAS proteins because it sits at the very top and critical position of this cascade of signals. One way to do that is to label the KRAS protein with a molecule that emits light, and then use an optical microscope to look at them, track them, and analyze their interactions. However, the optical microscopes have a resolution limit. 
meaning that if you have one dot in your sample, what you will see under the microscope is just one large blurry blob. Now imagine if your goal is to understand the interactions of the KRAS proteins, you would expect a handful of dots constantly coming up close to each other. And what you will see under the microscope is just one large blurry blob. You will lose track of the individual dots. So that is a challenge. In my work, I have developed an image processing algorithm to tackle this challenge. I used a constraint called the sparsity constraints to tell the algorithm that there is only a handful of dots behind each blurry blob. I also tell the computer that how does one dot look like as an individual blob in the observed image. And then the algorithm can solve a mathematical inverse problem to find out the precise locations of the individual dots behind each large blurry blob. By doing that, for the first time, I was able to resolve the close-range interactions of the KRAS proteins. We can imagine using this method to test the cancer drugs that are designed to target the KRAS proteins that contain mutations, and then verify whether the influence of the drug will bring their interactions back to normal. With better, with better understanding, we can achieve better observation, better understanding, and we also achieve a better additional testing metric for the cancer drugs. I hope one day our work can help us move closer to the cure for cancer. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Brandon Foley, also from PLS, and the title of his presentation is Urgent Problems Need Fast Solutions. How better math can slow global warming. Urgent problems need fast solutions, and today, there's no problem more urgent than global climate change. By burning fossil fuels such as coal, humans have released 2.4 trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, where it traps in heat, initiating a domino effect where ice caps melt, sea levels rise, and droughts and storms become more frequent and severe. Scientists agree, we need to do something about climate change today, and if we don't, then in 30 years, we're gonna pass a tipping point the dire consequences of climate change will become irreversible and unavoidable. One way to combat climate change would be if we could flip this reaction around and convert CO2 back into fuels that we can use. Unfortunately, this is a really challenging reaction, and scientists have struggled to find a feasible way to do this. However, researchers have recently discovered a whole new way to make chemical reactions happen. They've shown that if you take a special metal called a catalyst, and oscillate its electric potential at just the right frequency and wave shape so you can increase the rate of a reaction that might not otherwise happen at all. Now this is extremely exciting because there are millions of materials and the oscillation wave shape can be literally any shape, not just the one shown in the circle here, meaning that there are literally infinite possibilities for us to explore. The problem is that these calculations take a long time. Just these 19 data points took the researchers over a month to calculate. And we don't have that kind of time. The tipping point is just three decades away. That's why I developed a new way to solve these problems. I discovered that if you take the oscillation wave and discretize it into small steps, and then change the problem from an initial value problem to a periodic boundary value problem, that you can simplify the equations in a way that are fast and easy for a computer to solve. Using this method, I calculated the data shown by the solid line, which is in excellent agreement with the previous researcher's results. The key difference is that my method takes only 0.1 milliseconds per data point. That's one billion times faster. For perspective, in the 30 years that we have until the tipping point, the old method could do about as many calculations as my new method can do in just one second. Now, instead of testing different frequencies and wave shapes, we can instead use a computer to quickly find the best wave shape and frequency for a given material, which my method can do in just four seconds. 
Now we can quickly test different materials and see if they are good candidates for our reaction, giving us the fast answers that we need for our urgent CO2 problem. Thank you. Our last but not least is Sarah Sandholtz, who's going to be talking. Her title is A Shot in the Dark or a Surefire Hit, Identifying Drug Targets for COVID-19. I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that there almost certainly will be another pandemic during our lifetime. The good news is that the next pandemic doesn't need to be as devastating as this one has been. If we could discover therapeutics to treat a new disease within weeks of the emergence of the virus that causes it, rather than months, we could save thousands of lives. This won't be easy, but it could be possible. Developing new drugs is like shooting darts at a dartboard. The darts are drug compounds, and the board is one of the proteins that makes up the new virus. The bullseye is what you're aiming for, the drug target, or the part of the protein that will react with the drug to change the protein's function so that it doesn't make you sick. Running an experiment to test if a compound is effective is like throwing one dart at the board. In a typical game of darts, there's a single board with a single bullseye. Your target is obvious, but with drug discovery, it's not so simple. There are multiple boards, each with multiple bullseyes. How do you know where to throw your dart? Now you could use brute force and throw a dart at every bullseye on every board, but that would be time consuming and expensive. What if there was a way to narrow the possibilities? Imagine if you knew from the beginning that you only needed to try hitting one or two of the bullseyes on each of the boards. That knowledge would save you a lot of time and effort. My research aims to do just that, We've taken publicly available experimental data of protein structures and run it through an in-house structural modeling program, which predicts which parts of SARS-CoV-2 proteins will bind with which small molecules. Using clustering techniques from data science and cheminformatics tools, I've developed an automated computational procedure to analyze the patterns of binding in our modeling data. Based on those patterns, my pipeline identifies relevant binding sites in SARS-CoV-2 as well as the site-specific core chemical components involved in binding. From my results, I propose two simple rules of thumb for which binding sites will make more effective drug targets, which will help us prioritize our dart shots. The more similar the structure of a SARS-CoV-2 binding site is to the structure of binding sites in other viruses, the more promising it may be as a drug target. And the more drug-like the molecules that bind to that site, the more promising it may be. The process I've created can tell us both which bullseyes to aim for and how to design our darts. My approach is fast, relatively straightforward, and based on experimental data. And the best part is, my method is generalizable. We can apply it to any new virus, as long as its genome sequence is available. Since it doesn't require expensive or sophisticated tools, you won't need special equipment to set up your game of drug discovery darts. So there's no need to take a shot in the dark when you can illuminate your target. Thank you. All right, my judging panel is back. So this meeting has been exciting for many reasons. One was that we used more uh, virtual platforms in this one meeting than we normally do in a whole week. So uh, credit to the judging panel for expertly moving from platform to platform. Uh, this is also the most difficult thing I've done all week. And you'll recall I gave an all hands yesterday where I announced you know, a whole bunch of new things. So I just want to say to the postdocs who presented today, your work is incredible. Uh, the judging panel had an enormously difficult task because everything you talked about was fun and exciting. The enthusiasm you brought to your presentations was incredible. Um, it's really what makes it exciting to come to work here every day for us. And so thank you for that. Thank you all for participating. Our job, however, was to pick winners. Uh, you are all winners in my book, and everyone gets free ice cream after this, and uh, you know, take two. But 
uh, our expert judging panel did work through the list. And I, should we start with the People's Choice Award? So the uh, folks in the audience, thank you all for everyone who tuned in, uh, voted on the People's Choice Award. And that goes to Mariana Desiree Reale Batista. And I'm gonna have to wear my headband. So if you wanna come, it's right behind me. There we go. You can stand by your, <laughs> we practiced this numerous times. All right, so drum roll. In third place, talking to us about how urgent problems need fast solutions, Brandon Foley. And we all agreed that you made math both very accessible and interesting. So no mathematicians on the panel, and we really loved it. In second place, and winning my unofficial award for best walk-up song, by the way, everyone's music was awesome. Uh, since I uh, came of age in the 80s, um, a shot in the dark or a surefire hit, Sarah Sandholtz. Pat Benatar is always in good taste. That was great. And in first place, <laughs> talking about our continuing glass mission, Rebecca Walton. So I wanna say thank you and congratulations to all of our winners and all of our participants. Everyone did great. We really look forward to having all of you represent us in the Bay Area Slam. I think that's gonna be amazing and I expect great things from our team. And I would like to also thank the team that put the event together, uh, that stage managed the whole thing, uh, that helped all the presenters uh, get ready for this big event. I just think it's been wonderful and for me to get a chance to see the incredible work we do here was just a treat, a total treat. So thanks to everybody. So one more round of applause for our winners and all of our postdoc participants.